The crazy thing here is that you feeling the anger and appropriately assigning the blame to him for his harm is the doorway to your freedom. You saying I need to put away the anger is going back into the mind. Hi everyone, and welcome to uh, the Patrick Doyle Show. I'm joined today by Amber Lynn. She is the community director for Pathway to Hope, which is an online membership program for women who are being affected by toxic or emotionally abusive relationships. And uh, she does a great job managing the community, which keeps it safe and productive. So Amber's also a um, life transition coach and uh, works with people who are trying to make a transition. Um, with specific understanding to, you know, the problems of abuse. Um, so today, Amber, um, we've decided to do some questions from the audience. Um, and I'm looking forward to that because it's one of my favorite things to do to answer questions because it puts things in context for people rather than just me talking about a subject. I get to talk about it in relationship to someone asking a question and their specific scenario. So without any further ado, what's our first question? Sure. Okay. Let me get in here. First question is, um, I have learned a lot from your videos. I decided after 22 years of marriage to separate, even though he is a manipulative narcissist, I'm so scared to leave. She's wondering if that is normal. So how long? Uh, she said 22 years, 22 years. Um, so, First of all, yes, it's very normal to be scared. And the um, the reason why that is, is because you've been with someone for 22 years that's been undermining you, that's been telling you you're the problem, that's been blame shifting, that's been lying, that's been minimizing, rationalizing, justifying, gaslighting. And remember, gaslighting is the idea that they're going to tell you that your perception of reality isn't right. Mm -hmm. So... The underlying reality is you're fearful of any confrontation because of the consequences that you get emotionally. You are emotionally harmed every time there's any sort of confrontation. And that harm could be 1% or it could be 100%, but there's harm every time. And after years and years and years of it, it would make a lot of sense that you would be afraid to move forward. I often call it with folks, you're really afraid to poke the bear again. Yeah. And so this time, instead of poking the bear, you're going to slap him in the face really hard and divorce him. So okay. you're fearful of the reaction and the stuff they're going to do. But it's really important to know that the only way for your life to be safe and peaceful is to remove the toxic people from it. And this is where you start. And I've walked with thousands of women through the process from recognizing that they have a problem all the way through to being free and on the other side of the toxic person. And I can tell you right now, it's never easy. And the number one thing you're going to need to do in the process is grieve the loss of your dream. Mm -hmm. What you've worked so hard for for 22 years was a wonderful, healthy, you know, mutual, beneficial, loving, caring relationship. Yeah. The tragedy is the person that you've been trying to get to do that is unable because of their profound level of denial. Mm -hmm. People who can't accept responsibility for their behavior don't do so because they are in denial. They believe that it is genuinely your fault. And if you would just do what they wanted, everything would work out. The problem is that slowly, I call it the death of a thousand cuts, it slowly kills the other person solically. So now that you're at that place of feeling the death of your soul, and the consequences of that, that's a mercy. So moving forward, what you're going to do is spend the energy rather than on trying to make something work that clearly isn't no more giving CPR to the dead guy. Now you're going to take that energy as much as possible and you won't do it every time, but every time you do do it, it's a, it's a moving in the right direction. You're going to take that energy that you've been spending on the dead guy and put it into you mm -hmm. and taking care of you and moving yourself away from toxic. And I promise you in the long run, your life will be way better off for it. So yes, it's normal to be fearful. Absolutely. 
Uh, next question that had come in, how do I know if marriage counseling will be helpful or harmful? Well, if you're talking about marriage counseling with someone who's abusive, it will be harmful. Mm. It's a guarantee. Because again, like I mentioned in the first question, the person who's harming you has really high levels of denial. I call it malignant denial. It's so thick, it's going to create relational death. Mm. And it already is, which is why you're going to counseling. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to women who have been in years, I mean, years of counseling, and all it did was slowly kill them. Mm. Because generally, the person you're in the relationship with is going to manipulate the counselor. And it's the very rare counselor who has the skills and or the guts and courage to call it out. Yeah, it's it. it, it and if you're going to a, if you're going to a, a Christian counselor, or one from your church, my experience is, that's a very high probability that you're going to get further harmed. If you're going to go to counseling with someone who's been abusive, who's been emotionally abusive, who's avoided responsibility, you need to go to somebody who specializes in this, who gets it, who's not afraid to confront, who's not afraid to help you look at how you're denying their behavior. There's a lot to it. But um, the most important thing I would say is not you doing counseling to save the marriage. I would say the most important thing for you to do is to do some counseling to save yourself. Mm. Go to counseling on your own with someone who specializes in this. Watch my videos, uh, other people's videos. There's lots of information. There's lots of really good information out on the YouTube nowadays about this kind of stuff. So put the energy into you. Don't put your energy into the marriage. If that was going to work, you wouldn't be watching this video. Yeah. You'd be having a great life with the partner you put all the energy into. But because it doesn't work, you continue to go merry on the merry-go-round. I call it the torture go-round. <laughs> yeah. We just keep torturing ourselves with the same thing, have the same looping arguments, have the same bad outcomes, have the same chaotic, unhealthy, internal disrest that you can't resolve. And the reason why you can't resolve it is because a person that you're dealing with is unable to because of their denial. Their denial is so thick. And let's just talk about that for a second. We talk about it as narcissism, okay, or all the other diagnoses. But at the bottom of all of that is the person you're dealing with has such a profound level of denial that they believe their own lies. Mm -hmm. They believe what they're telling you is true, even though there's evidence that it's not. I mean, I have shown people videos of their behavior and had them look at me and say, I didn't do that. The ultimate high level gaslighting. And even for me, sometimes it took a second, like, well, you know, <laughs> I, I doubted myself for a second. It's a funny story. Years ago, I worked in DUI treatment. And um, so everybody in this group, and I did this for years, I did uh, drug and alcohol treatment for years, did DUI groups for years. And so I've, I've confronted thousands of people in denial. Okay, so I understand this, but so this one guy comes to group and now in his bench probation, because he had a DUI, it's like you can't drink for 90 days and you have to prove sobriety for 90 days, right? Well, he comes to DUI group and as soon as he walks in, the whole room smelled like alcohol and everybody just starts looking at each other and everybody in the DUI group is really nervous because they don't want to get you know in trouble. And so <laughs> he sits down and I say, well, smells like somebody has been drinking. And you know, everybody's just like, mm. everybody knows who it is, but they're all still just kind of paranoid. And so I said, well, anybody want to confess to drinking? No one says anything. I said, well, we're going to find out. And I go get the breathalyzer and I bring it into the room and I made sure that he was last. <laughs> zero, 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 zero. He goes, 0. 0.12. <laughs> so he's, he's like almost double the legal limit coming to DUI group. So my first question was for him, I said, well, how did you get here? He said, well, I walked. I'm like, okay, first hurdle passed. I said, I said, so <clears throat> looks like you've been drinking. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, no, I have not been drinking. You need to check the calibration of that machine. <laughs> 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 and for a split second, I was like, well, yeah, well, no, <laughs> but the, the courage and the, the absolute certainty of his denial caused me a moment's doubt. 
a single second. And I've been doing this for years. So if you're in a relationship with somebody who can gaslight at that level, it's going to destroy your soul. So that's why you have to start putting the energy into yourself instead of trying to change that. You can't change that level of denial. It's not possible. And if it is, it isn't going to come from you. So the other thing I talk to people all the time about is like, look, if consequences broke denial, there'd be no addicts. If consequences broke denial, people would change radically way sooner than they do. But the truth is people go to their graves in denial, doing harmful behaviors to themselves. That's the truth. History is replete with examples. Both my parents died in alcoholism. No one, no one saved them. No, no consequence changed them. The doctor looking my dad in the eye and saying, you have huh, you know, late, late stage liver failure from your drinking. You need to stop and my dad keeps drinking. That's what you call malignant denial. Somebody's gonna die. Some emotional relationship's gonna be harmed. You can't function in a healthy way with somebody that has that kind of denial. So, don't put the energy into the marriage, put it into you. All right, well, thank you for that. Next question that came through. She says, thank you for speaking truth for us who've been abused. I grew up with an alcoholic mother who was abusive verbally, emotionally, and physically. All my relationships have been with this type of person. Why do I attract them? I, I seem to be deceived by them. I'm a believer in Jesus. My husband is an alcoholic. I was in a previously verbally abusive relationship for 25 years. Mm -hmm. Yet here I am again. How? Mm -hmm. So, it's really important in situations like this, like what I, what, what's embedded in the question is why am I so, so stupid or so unable or so attractive to, why do I have the sign on my forehead that says, please hurt me? Why is it, why do I attract these people? Well, you don't, <laughs> what you have is training. Okay. I grew up in an about, I grew up in an abusive alcoholic home. So I know what the training is deeply inside. I've also studied and I've also worked with tens of thousands of addicts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so listen, one of the, you, everybody who grows up in an alcoholic home learns two rules. No one ever says them, but they're completely implied. And those two rules are, number one, don't talk. Number two is don't feel, mm -hmm. okay? Two very hugely damaging rules to somebody who's going to be healthily, health, healthy emotionally. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that you learned as a small child is like, look, you did not sit up in heaven and say, God, please send me to a crazy alcoholic family where I get harmed and mistreated. Yeah. But it's what happened. Okay, mm -hmm. so in that family, they told you by their behavior that you're the problem, that you're not worth being cared for, that you're not worth the skin you're printed in, that you are, you know, incompetent, whatever. Mm -hmm. So that gets so deeply embedded in us at such a young age, we think it is us. Mm -mm. Look, there's nothing wrong with you when you came into this world, but over time, their behavior, God bless them, their inability to function, their, their addiction, their out of controlness was training you to believe this is what you deserved. And that's why you've made selections in relationships because when we start to think about ourselves as valuable, guess what? The crazy thing is when we start to feel valuable internally, our mind tells us there's something wrong. That can't be true. It's called cognitive dissonance. It starts to make us feel like, well, that's, I can't. So you start to move in something healthy and your brain tells you to move away from it and you feel more comfortable in the harm because it's, it's um, actually congruent with the training. But the training did not come from you. It came from unhealthy people around you and you've had it your whole life. So the fact that you're starting to see it as not okay, yay. That means there's movement. That means we're moving away from it. And listen, the problem isn't you. You have problems, but you are not the problem. This is what all the very unhealthy people in your life have told you. Yeah. Now, 
having been somebody who had that training and had to work through it, one of the most difficult and challenging things I ever faced was being cared for. Mm. All of my training told me that's not possible. You're the problem. Mm -hmm. So to be in a healthy relationship, you have to be cared for. Well, somebody who's an addict, what do I always say? Addicts don't have relationships. They take hostages. Mm -hmm. Addicts, by the nature of their addiction, cannot be safe people because they're 100% self-focused because of their addiction. And anybody who has a good addiction has a very healthy denial structure. So if somebody's addicted and in full-blown denial, how can there be any intimacy? There can't be, which feels very normal to a person that grew up in an alcoholic home. Yeah. I didn't have any intimacy. I didn't know what it was. So when I first started to like and see it and look at it and be a part of it, it freaked me out. <laughs> so you have to start to work through this. So one of the things I would encourage you to do is stop spending energy on trying to fix the addict. That's bad investment. It's never going to return anything until they decide they're going to do something different. All you're going to do is waste your time and energy. So instead of focusing on that, go to some Al-Anon, start investing in yourself, start looking at, read the book, Alcohol, uh, Adult Children of Alcoholics. It's amazing how consistent the, in, the damage is done to us, how, if, how it comes out. That book will give you great insight. Okay, start to invest in yourself. Stop trying to fix the addict and stop blaming yourself for their harm. That's so good. You can't control them. Obviously, if you could, you'd have a better life. Yeah. So it's really important that in those scenarios, you recognize the training that you received and you stop blaming yourself for the bad choices that you didn't have any, you didn't have any training to do anything else. It was all the training told you to go this way. Now, as we start to work through that, you're going to get some different choices. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I want you to focus on and stop dislocating your hip to kick yourself in the rear. You're not the problem. Mm. You have problems, but you're not the problem. That's good. All right. Um, last question. I want to thank you for being a champion for abused women. My husband was emotionally and verbally abusive and I left the marriage after watching your videos. You brought me clarity, clarity about my situation. Do you have any advice on how I can overcome the anger and bitterness I am feeling towards my ex-husband? He has now gotten engaged to a woman from overseas and is flaunting his new relationship. It doesn't seem fair that he gets to move on without a second thought or repercussions. I need help to overcome the anger. Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I want to encourage you. Don't overcome the anger. Lean into it. Okay? The anger is healthy. I I believe that anger is what gets to the surface, but below anger is injustice. Mm -hmm. If we stack up the amount of injustice this man did to you. Still is. And still is. And then we put the anger equal to the injustice. You might kill him. So the anger is a healthy sign that you're aware of the injustice and the anger is a healthy sign. You're no longer denying it. Denial is how we survive the injustice. My dad's beating me and I'm blaming myself for not being a good enough kid. But the truth is my dad's a lunatic from war and PTSD and alcoholism. And it wasn't until I was able to see who's responsible for what. And once I did, guess what happened? I got very angry. Like what? All this injustice? So your ex is never going to do justice. Not going to. Denial, rationalize, he, he's not capable. Mm -hmm. So the crazy thing here is that you feeling the anger and appropriately assigning the blame to him for his harm is the doorway to your freedom. You saying, I need to put away the anger is going back into denial. Yeah. The avoidance of pain is the beginning of all unhealthy behavior. I'm really sorry that you've been through such harm. I get it. But avoiding that anger and the harm 
and the grief of years of your life lost while he goes off with some woman who he bought off the internet and he's going to harm and she won't care because it's 10 times better than where she came from or whatever. That's his problem. And I want you to celebrate being rid of the crazy man Mm -hmm. and start investing that in you. But to answer the question, don't avoid your anger, document it, document why document the injustice, grieve it out. And here's the example I will tell you. Over the years in that relationship, he cut you, cut you, cut you, cut you. You have all these open wounds. And so when he does something, he takes his finger and he jabs it in one of those open wounds. And you're like, oh my gosh, that hurts. Okay. That's normal. If you weren't reacting to someone poking an open wound, I'd be worried about you. Okay, but listen, if we go through the process of healing, and now instead of all these open wounds, we have scars. Someone pokes my scar, I don't react. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the deal isn't to pretend like I don't have the wound. The deal is to work on healing it. And the way we heal it is through the grief, which all of us want to avoid. (laughs) We have a natural instinct to be avoidant of pain. But what I'm asking you to do is walk into the buzzsaw of of the grief. Let yourself be in the fetal position. I saw a great quote the other day. It's like, I want, I want, I want everybody to know I got a new position. It's the fetal position. (laughs) 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 So, you know, that is a very healthy way to, to actually move through the pain. One of my favorite quotes, uh, tears are the blood of the soul. Okay, so when your skin is cut, the first thing that happens is that you bleed, which makes bleeding the first stage of healing, right? So solically speaking, emotionally speaking, when you're cut, the first stage of healing is crying. But we have a lot of misinformation in our world about the emotional health of that kind of sadness and that kind of weeping and that kind of grieving. We've been talked out of it and particularly in the spiritual world. I mean, all those years in the church, I taught it like, you know, if trust the Lord, don't, you know, forget what lies behind, press on the high calling, you know, he's going to take care of in heaven, all things that were well intentioned, but they're terrible advice. Because, you know, really, what we need to do is grieve, we need to let it out. That's really the most spiritual thing you could do is have the trust that you're going to be carried and boy and, and buoyed through it by your spirit. Instead of denying it and rationalizing it and avoiding it and saying it's the spiritually right thing to do, Mm-mm. that will lead you to a bad place. Mm-hmm. So grieve it out. And here's the thing with grief. There is no timeline. Mm-hmm. I, I, I liken grief to the waves of the ocean. You never know how strong they're going to be or how high they're going to be. And you don't have any control when they come in. And what I want you to do is ride them out. Let the grief come in, cry it out. Next day, you might not have any. Great. Enjoy your day. When it comes again, let it out. I also encourage documentation of those things so that later on you can see the context like, wow, I have really made a lot of progress. That doesn't bother me the way it used to. I really have been healing. I really am not so sensitive to those things. And listen, being sensitive to somebody tearing your soul apart is appropriate. You're not supposed to be okay with that. That's the denial that lets us survive harm. We don't want to do that. There's nothing wrong with you either for be exactly. having those things. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually a sign there's something really right with you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I just hope that you'll embrace that grief and don't focus on him, but focus on your own healing and focus on the beauty of your own spirit. Mm-hmm. The beauty that has not allowed his horrible behavior to crush you and turn you into some horrible person. That's not the case. So embrace that grief and live your life to the fullest as much as possible. And don't give energy to the crazy man. It's good. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. My pleasure.
If anybody else has questions, uh, you can email short questions to info at patrickdoyle.life and we can yes. go through those and we'll do yes, more of these. Mm -hmm. If you have longer questions or a situation you'd like to talk to Patrick about, I'd encourage you to sign up for Pathway to Hope. We yes. do this twice a month, live interactions, and we actually take live calls from women in the community. So you get to hear their questions and their responses. They're recorded and so you can rewatch them and also share your situation with Patrick and get some mm -hmm. insights that way too. Yeah. So um, yeah. you can get more information by going to the website, which is www.patrickdoyle.life. Those links are in the bottom of this video. Um, so yeah, do you have anything else? You please, please subscribe and like. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful to, you know, be able to help thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people, because what we're dealing with is an epidemic and yeah. it's really hard to find people who understand. And so I will really want this information to get to as many people as possible. So you can help us by liking or subscribing. Okay. So thank you, Amber, for all the work you do and look forward to the next uh, Patrick Dolan show. All right, till next time. You bet.